gathered together with all the assemblies of bodhisattvas, masattvas, as numerous as five most of dust in an ocean of lands, who came from the remaining worlds of the ten directions. They all came to the Sa world, so here Shakyamuni Buddha teach the Flower Adorno Sutra, and to hear universal worthy bodhisattvas speak the chapter on the conduct of and vows of universal worthy. They came from lands as numerous as dust most in an ocean of lands. Their numbers were inexpressible and incalculable. All bodhisattvas, masattvas are very many great bodhisattvas. They were headed by the great wise Shariputra, Mahamaud Gaudiya Yamna, and others. They were both Mahamaud Gaudiya Yamna and the one of great wisdom, Shariputra. Shariputra was foremost in wisdom. How do we know this? When Shariputra was in his mother's womb, his mother was able to defeat her brother in debate, even though before she was with tried, she could not defeat him. Her brother had defeated her in debate every time. But when Shariputra's mother became pregnant with Shariputra, she never lost a debate with her brother. She always won. Her brother knew that the child in her womb was certainly exceptional, and he said, "He certainly has much wisdom to help you win in debate. You were never so smart before, so it's certain that you have a very wise child in your womb." From the day of this realization, he reflected that if his person, his sister, had a child, he would be an uncle. An uncle defeated. In debate by his nephew would lose a lot of faith. That therefore he decided that he must travel about and study the tenets of all the philosophies and religions of his time, so that he could have a proper relationship with his nephew. How diligently did he study? He did not cut his hair or shave his beard. In fact. He did not even have time to cut his fingernails. It was not that he did not want to cut his hair or shave or cut his nails, but rather that he did not have time to cut them. He was constantly studying the tenets of externalist paths. His fingernails grew so long that they grew in cones, and everyone called him long fingernails. One with long fingernails. Who cultivated pure practices? He was so busy; he did not have time to cut his fingernails. Do you not think that his motivation was great? Why did he study so hard? He wanted to be able to return home and defeat his nephew, the child of his younger sister. That was his reason. After he studied for a few decades, he returned home and told his teacher that he wanted to debate her son. When he learned that his sister did not have hair, tried have tried with her. He asked, "Where is your son?" She replied, "He has already left the home life with Shakyamuni Buddha." When the, the uncle, whose name was Kaushtila, heard this, he became upset. How can he leave the home life with the Buddha? What kind of virtue does the Buddha have that the child would leave the home life with him? He should study the way with me. My learning and virtue are the highest. Why did he want to leave the home life with Shakyamuni Buddha? Then Kaushtila went off looking for Shakyamuni Buddha in order to find his nephew. He wanted his nephew back, but he needed a method to get him back. He could not just ask for him back without a reason. So he decided to debate with the Buddha. He had studied debate. He was a debater, and he was sure he could win. When he found Shakyamuni Buddha, he asked him, "What do you think you are doing, taking my nephew as your disciple? What skills do you have to give you this right?" Shakyamuni Buddha replied, "I am without any skills. He wanted to leave home with me, so what else could I do?" The uncle said, "Well, then I debate with you. Let's choose a topic." Shakyamuni Buddha replied, "What shall we debate? You go ahead and begin." The uncle said, 
my tenet is that I don't accept anything. This is my principle. Whatever you say, I won't accept it. Shakyamuni Buddha then responded, Your tenet is that you don't accept anything. Well then, do you or do you not accept your view that you don't accept anything? Kaushila thought, If I accept this view, I will contradict my original tenet because I said that I don't accept anything. But if I do not accept this statement, I will have set up a contradiction in the logic of my tenet. If I accept it, I will be defeated. And if I don't accept it, I will still be defeated. What am I going to do? Before Kaush Thela began the debate with Shakyamuni Buddha, he made a bet that if he lost, he would give his head to the Buddha. But if Shakyamuni Buddha lost, he should return Kaushthila's nephew. When Kaushthila realized his own principle would not stand up, he panicked. He turned around and ran. He ran for almost two hours. How far can you run in two hours? Not too far. Finally, he thought, I'm a Brahmin. How can I not keep my word? If I said I will give my head, then I will give my head. Why make such a big deal out of it? I should keep my word. So he ran back to see the Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha said, Why have you returned? He answered, Give me a knife. Why should I give you a knife? Because I want to cut off my head and give it to you. Shakyamuni Buddha said, What good will it do for you to cut off your head to give to me? Because I said I would. The uncle admitted that he had made this agreement. I said clearly that if I were defeated, I would give my head to you. Shakyamuni Buddha replied, It would be useless to cut your head off to give to me. What can I do with your head? But if you don't cut it off, it might still be of some use. If you keep it on your shoulders, you won't die. And so you can live the whole life and become a monk. Wouldn't that be better? Why cut it off? Your head is mine now, and I don't want you to cut it off. I want it kept on your body. All you must do is shave it. Shaving your head is equivalent to cutting it off. Kawustila said with relief, Oh, that's agreeable. And he left the home life and became a monk with Shakyamuni Buddha. Shariputra's name means the son of Shari. His name came from his mother's name, which, is, which was Shari. Putra means sun. The Shari is a kind of Indian bird. The Chinese say it is the egg red. The bird's eyes are very beautiful and sparkling. Shari Putra's mother's eyes were as beautiful as an egg red. So she was called Shari. And her son was called the son of Shari, Shari Putra. Maha means great, and so Maha Maudgalyayana was the great Maudgalyayana. Maudgalyayana also sounds great, means both turnip and descended from bean pickers. When his ancestors cultivated the way, they ate these foods. So his name came from his relatives. In the Buddha's assembly, Mahudgalayana was the disciple foremost in spiritual penetrations. Both he and the great wise Sariputra were at the head of the assembly of all the great South heroes. All the great South heroes, along with all the pupil, gods, and lords of all worlds. South heroes are those who hear the Buddha sound and enlighten to the way. They hear the Dharma of the Four Truths, suffering, accumulation, extinction, and the way, and become enlightened. They are enlightened to the fact that defiling afflictions harm them, and they cultivate accordingly, thus becoming enlightened. Along with means that there were not only Bodhisattvas, South Heroes, and those enlightened to conditions in the assembly, but that there were others as well, including people, God, spirits of the heavens, and lots of all worlds, who are kings of countries as well as dragons and others. There are many kinds of dragons. Dragons were people who, when they cultivated, wished for quick attainment, but neglected the precepts. 
so they became dragons. Such people can recite all kinds of mantras, recite sutras, meditate, and can quickly learn any Dharma draw, but they do not hold the precepts. They do not hold the precept against killing. They do not hold the precept against stealing. They do not hold the precept against sexual misconduct. They do not hold the precept against lying, and they do not hold the precept against taking intoxicants. They do not receive and keep the five precepts. And so they fall and receive the body of a dragon. What is more, dragons are angry. Their anger are very great. Why is it that most of them become become dragons just because of their anger? Those who study the Buddha Dharma should not be lazy. In monasteries, the wooden boards are heated at three thirty in the morning. A wooden mallet. Is used to strike a wooden boat, which produces a sharp sound. When the people hear this, they should all get up. Then the drum is beaten. If you stay in bed when you hear the drum being beaten, you might become a dragon in the future. People who do not honor the rules of a monastery can become dragons. If your behavior is a little worse, you can become a snake. So do not think that. Being a little lazy is acceptable. If you do not get up in the morning, then you, when you hear the drum, you can become a snake. And if you do not rest when you hear the evening bell, you may also suffer a bad retribution. Dragons become dragons because they do not follow rules. What are dragons? Worms. Dragons are big worms that eat fish and that are bitten by other creatures. I'll tell you about this later. There are many kinds, many kinds of yakshas: flying yakshas, heavenly yakshas, earthbound traveling yakshas, and water-going yakshas. Yakshas and dragons are among the ghosts and spirits of the eight divisions. Yaksha in Sanskrit it means speedy ghost. Yakshas travel very fast; they are fearsome. One yaksha may have ten heads, or ten yakshas might share on head. Is this not strange? One yaksha may have ten legs, or ten yakshas might share one leg. That's how weird they are. They may have three or five legs. Their form in is not fixed. They might also just be a head or just two legs. They can be extraordinarily weird freaks. If you do not know about them and you see one, it can scare you to death. Gandavas are the musical spirits of the Jade Emperor. These spirits are also known as incense sniffing spirits. When the Jade Emperor lies is sinking in water incense, these spirits flock together from all around to smell it, and they play their music there. They are very skilled musicians. They are the incense and music spirits for the Jade Emperor. Asura. Is a Sanskrit word which means incessant fighter. It is also translated as one without wine. Asuras are incorrigible fighters who are also very ugly. The second name simply means that they do not have any wine to drink. They have the blessings of the heavens without the authority of the heavens. Asuras are of many kinds and they can be found among the gods. Humans, ghosts, and animals, and in their house, there are asuras in all the paths of rebirth. An asura is one who likes to find more than anything else. He likes to find with words, with his body, and with his heart. He likes to find with the three commas of body, mouth, and mind. Female asuras are ex- extremely beautiful. Not only do men fall in love with them, but when the dread emperor himself. Saw a female asura, he became desirous of her. The dread emperor does have some samadhi power, but when he saw the asura woman whose name was Shuchu, he lost it all. To the point that he decided to ask the asura king if he could marry her. The asura king approved of the dread emperor's request and gave his daughter to him in marriage. The Dread Emperor was delighted to have such a beautifully heavenly maiden, and so he in- invited the Asura King for a feast. 
to show the utmost of respect, he used his heavenly armies to welcome the Asura king. On the day of the feast, the heavenly armies all turned out in full regalia to greet him. The Asura king was very mistrustful and liked to fight. When he saw the heavenly armies in full battle dress, he thought, Oh, you great dread emperor, you want to show off your strength to me, so you have sent out your armies to frighten me. This doesn't make any sense. But although he was very unhappy with the dread emperor, he remained quiet. The dread emperor liked to go to the world, so he asserted his plan the sutras. There was a particular accomplished sage who explained the dread emperor's might seal wonderful sutra. He also explained the sutra on the three kinds of supreme ecclesia, the spirit and vital energy. Illusive, intangible, and invisible is the town. Support emptiness, protect existence. In the end, you will be successful and unite with heaven and earth. It takes 100 days to accomplish this. After they were married, the dread emperor's Asura wife got jealous when he went out every day to hear Sutras explained. She asked the dread emperor, Where do you go every day? Why don't you stay at home? He answered, I go to the realm of people to listen to Sutras. There is one person who lectures the dread emperor's might still wonderful Sutra, so I go to listen. The Asura woman said, I'd like to listen too, let's go together. The dread emperor said, You are a woman, you can't go listen to sutras there. An immortal lectures the sutras in that place, and he doesn't like women to come. The Asura woman had more doubts and said, You don't want me to go? You are certainly carrying on with other women. The Asura woman had spiritual powers, so when the dread emperor went off, in his flying palace to hear the sutras lectured. She became invisible, so he could not see her, and she rode off with him to listen to the sutras too. When the dread emperor got out of the cart, the Asura woman became visible again, and the dread emperor said, What are you doing here? She replied, I've come to listen to the sutras. The dread emperor took out his whip and beat her, and she cried out, the sutra lecturing immortal hurt her and had never heard a woman cry out like this before, and it attracted his attention. When he saw such a beautiful woman, he gave rise to desire. He was moved by thoughts of desire to the point that he could not even lecture sutras. When he lost his karma of the way, the dread emperor got even more upset, and so he returned home. After they returned, the Asura woman went to see her father and said, the dread emperor has been treating on me. He goes out and has affairs with all sorts of women. He told me he was going to listen to sutras, and so I made myself invisible and went with him. But when I appeared, he said I was wrong and beat me. When her father heard this, he got very angry. How dare he beat you? He assembled his Asura uh, armies and ordered them to attack. They planted their feet on the bottom of the sea and shook the heavenly palace with their feast. The dread emperor's spiritual powers were insufficient to repel the Asura king, and so he went to ask Shakyamuni Buddha to help. Shakyamuni Buddha replied, Don't worry, go back and tell your armies to recite Mahaprana Paramita, and everything will be fine. The dread emperor returned to his armies, and as soon as they recited Mahaprana Prana Paramita, the Asura armies were defeated. Why? Because Mahaprana Paramita is wisdom, and Asuras are seeds of stupidity. As soon as they saw the light of wisdom, they were defeated. This is a general explanation of Asuras. Garudas are the great golden winged pongbus. They ate only dragons. Their bodies are huge, with a wingspan of 360 yoyanas. In the past, they would flap their wings and blow away all the water in the sea. With the water gone, the dragons were exposed, 
and the plumbers would eat them in the same way that we humans eat noodles. They would slurp up the dragons just like they were noodles and mouthful at a time. In one mouthful, a great golden winged pong bird could eat from 10 to 20 dragons. Since their wingspan is 360 yuanas, the diameter of their mouth must be 100 yuanas wide at the very least. It was easy for them to consume a few thousand dragons in a single meal. After the pong birds had been eating both the older dragons and their young for a long time, the elder dragons went to Shakyamuni Buddha and asked him to save them. We dragons and our offspring are almost all eaten up, they said. What can we do? Shakyamuni Buddha said. Don't worry, I'll give you a precept sash. Give each one of your dragons and offspring a threat from this sash. When the great golden winged pong bird comes looking for you, conceal yourself with this thread, and the pong bird won't be able to find you. Then the elder dragons returned home and tore up the sash, giving each of the dragons a thread, and so the golden pong birds had no way to find the dragons. Then they too went to the Buddha and said, You've saved the dragons, but now we have nothing to eat. We are going to starve to death. The great golden-winged pungbirds will all become extinct. The Buddha's compassion is impartial. You have saved the dragons, so now you should save us too. Shakyamuni Buddha said, Fine, if today you take refuge with the triple jewel, the Buddha, the drama, and the Sangha, and if you follow the precept against killing as well as the other five precepts, I will tell my disciples to give you seven grains of rice each time they eat. After this, you will not need to kill. Then the great golden winged pung birds took refuge with the triple jewel and became vegetarians and no longer ate dragons. Although they quite eating dragons, one does not see them anymore because there are so few left. Kina Raza called Daofu spirits and they also perform music for the Jade Emperor. Maho Ragas are great pythons. Humans, non humans, and so forth include all gods and the entire Great Assembly. All of those in the Great Assembly, upon hearing what the Buddha had said, were all greatly happy, faithfully accepted it, and put it into practice. They were all especially happy and believed in this inconceivable drama doll. They honored it and practiced it. The principles have not been explained completely due to a lack of time. I have just given you a shallow explanation. If you want to truly understand the meaning of this sutra, you should earnestly apply effort in your study. The Buddha drama is inconceivable and so it is called wonderful drama. This chapter on the conduct and vows of universal worthy is an inconceivable chapter. Therefore, if I were to explain the principles completely, it would take a long time. I have just given the most simple of explanations. If you wish to investigate the Buddha drama further, you should work hard on your own and look into it more. I don't know whether I have explained the sutra well or not, and I do not have hopes for good or bad. What is the meaning of this? I have explained as if I have not explained, and you should have it listened as if you have not listened. To be without listening and without explaining is the true wonderful drama. But if you truly want to reach the point where it is unnecessary to explain and, un and unnecessary to listen, you must understand this wonderful drama. Well, then you will not have wasted your time studying this sutra. What is the state of not having wasted your time? Eating is still eating, wearing clothes is still wearing clothes, and sleeping is still sleeping.